So I have the honor to depress the arrow. <laughs> and now I have another honor to talk in my regular voice. Hello, everybody. Hi. All right. So I'll be introducing Grace Fondo. Grace is a poet, fiction, and hybrid writer. Her work explores biracial identity, loss, womanhood, the process of healing, and the ways we are shaped by our history. She is a co-founder of the Daughters Tongue Coalition, has taught creative writing in East Oakland, and was a member of the Youth Speaks Collective, performing and facilitating poetry workshops around the Bay. Her poetry has been published in the theories of her, H-E-R capitalized, anthology, and the Oakland Review. And her flash fiction is forthcoming in Crack the Spine. Please welcome Grace Fondo. Thank you. Um, so before I begin, I just want to say a few quick thank yous. Um, first, thank you to um, Tanya Foster and Opal Palmer Adisa for your mentorship and support. Um, I would not have made it through this program without you. Um, also, thank you to all of my friends and classmates that I've made while I've been here, um, especially my daughter's tongue co-founders, Deshara and Ella, and best friends. Um, and also Caitlin <laughs> and everyone else thank you guys so much um, and also thank you to my family and friends for being here um, all the way from Chicago <laughs> all right so I'm gonna read some poems seam splitting I used to pull my reflection apart, white from brown, so I could meet everyone I had always missed. I am two halves torn, melted together. My pulse sings like a stranger, a language I've forgotten. Tonight, I crochet memory into a blanket. My ancestors wove canastas out of totora reeds, over, under, through. Tonight, my hands are not my own, over, under, through. Tonight, I pull myself apart. Abuelito's apartment. Abuelito's apartment smells like wet paint folds into itself like a kaleidoscope. I've never seen him without a paintbrush, never seen his walls the same color. I met him in a mint green living room when I was 18. He was 80 something but couldn't remember. He asked my name and twirled his paintbrush like he was writing me into the sky. In all the years, I thought about my father, who he could be, what I was missing, what I would find if I ever traveled to Ecuador. I never imagined grandparents. My abuelito, small and crooked in a kaleidoscope apartment he never leaves, every day challenging the walls, the swollen walls with a new layer of paint. Three weeks in Ecuador, I visit him seven times introduce myself and watch him carve my name again into the air with his paintbrush. His apartment is the kind of quiet that reminds you it's there. He seems to like it that way. His kids bring him groceries and my abuelita visits on Wednesdays and Sundays to cook. She moved out years before I met them, couldn't stand the fumes. The last time I see him, the living room is red. He hugs me like I'm someone he remembers, holds my face in a prayer of frail fingers, kisses my forehead like a grandfather. On my way out, he whispers to himself, Y la preciosa, ¿quién es? Mirror. 
I used to stare at my reflection in windows when nighttime turned them into mirrors. Stare until my features blurred and the glass showed me someone new. A girl in a country I had only visited in my dreams, but I went there so often it felt real, like the girl in the glass. One time, my stepmom caught me staring. I was ashamed, worried she would think I was vain, but I couldn't look away. I just looked at her reflection in the glass and then back at my own, wondering if she saw what I saw, a sister or a cousin, or maybe just a clearer iteration of me. Lake Atitlan. When my little sister turned 10, we traveled to Guatemala. Two white moms and two Latina sisters, one from Ecuador, one from Guatemala. Eva touched her native soil for the first time in nine and a half years, the first time since we adopted her as a baby. And I got to hold her hand as she saw her features in every little girl selling bracelets, every woman patting tortillas between fast clapping palms, every man steering speedboats and pickup trucks. Lake Atitlan is blue like the taste of missing, blue like a homeland you no longer recognize, blue like sand memories slipping through tight fingers. The other day, I found a picture of my family looking out at the lake, all of us sitting on a gray stone wall, Ava and my stepmom on the left, my mom and I on the right, in the middle, a long stretch of wall and a horizon of rippled water. It's the kind of picture you could tear in half and each side would still look complete. My little sister can see a piece of herself in every corner of a country that isn't hers anymore and can somehow talk without blue on her tongue, without the taste of missing in her voice. I went to Ecuador for the first time when I was 15 and I've spent a lifetime missing a place I never felt the right to claim. Today my sister is the anchor in the middle of a lesbian divorce splitting her weeks between two households. I'm half a country away pretending the photograph is still whole. She tells me about my stepmom's new house on the south side, how now she's finally in the same neighborhood as her friends and can walk to school with them. She tells me how my mom bought a new puppy and now between the two households she has three dogs. None of her friends have that many dogs. My sister is stronger than me. The jagged side of lovely, all beach glass and scraps of shell. She's teaching me how to reclaim broken pieces. Name them something beautiful, something to be proud of. She's teaching me how to survive after the ripping. All right, so I just have two more poems. Um, and funny story, a few years ago, I stopped writing poetry completely um, because I was really sick of writing about the same person. And it seemed that every single time I tried to write a poem, I wrote about him. Um, and then I came here with the intention of writing fiction. And I found my way back to poetry. <laughs> um, and luckily, I'm writing about a lot of new things, but every once in a while, he finds his way back into my poems. So um, these ones are those. But the perspective has changed, which I'm very grateful for. Um, this one is called Baraka, which is the name of an Ethiopian restaurant I used to work at during college. Sade sings through the old speakers at my job. I am a broken house, and my body is a flood of sad songs, the kind you feel in your knees, belly, and throat, the kind that sometimes you wail, but most of the time you just choke on. I bring Dorowat and Begwat to a happy couple at table 32, then hide my tears behind the bar. When my boss finds me, his smile runs away from him. He only met you once. Afterwards, he said to me, so that's why your heart is breaking. 
his Ethiopian accent cracking at heart like the bridge of a song. Today, he doesn't say anything, just looks at me for a long time like I imagine a father would. Then he pours me a tall glass of mango juice and changes the CD to Bob Marley. On his way back into the kitchen, he says over his shoulder, no more Sade today. <laughs> Heredity. You hate women just like your father and his father, so it runs in your blood, Warson Shire. One. One time your father tried to teach me how to play chess, but he got frustrated, said I was too stupid. Two. When your parents divorced, your sister sided with your mother in court and you with your father. Years later, your mom forgave you. You had two parents. Your sisters had one. Three. When you found out I didn't know how to ride a bike, you blamed my mother. She stood against the kitchen window with the low sun behind her like a marigold crown. I watched her spine wilt with shame. She kept her face calm and sturdy the way some single moms do when men tell them how to mother. Four, when my mom returned from Ecuador, 20 and pregnant, she hadn't told anyone. She raced her moped to her best friend's house, lost treading on the final corner into the cul-de-sac, loose wheels, limbs, and belly like matches striking against an entire block of tar. In the hospital, she didn't know if her baby had survived, didn't know if she could accept the painkillers. Five, as a kid, I was all loose limbs and flame had a permanent seat in the emergency waiting room for broken bones and split skin, tortured my mom with the memory of what she almost lost. Six, a few days after you blamed my mom in her own kitchen, you apologized, showed up to our house on a bike with a shiny red helmet slung over your shoulder jogged up the porch steps to where I was sitting on the swing, perched the helmet on my head, and tilted my face up to kiss you. I was terrified. You held on to my hips while I pedaled, ran behind me, holding me steady and pushing me to go faster. Before we turned the corner, I looked back at my mom on the porch steps, folding into herself like a house on fire. Thank you.